Okay, uh, this is first chapter for exam two. Uh, this is chapter 18 for physics 1102. And this will be dealing with electric current. So electric current. All right. So um, the other chapters we dealt with static electricity, and again we're using electrons. Which have a Q of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. All right. And we are You know, in this case, electrons moving through a wire. So we talk, you know, electrons are negative. So if electrons are actually moving this way, we have a positive current, which we use I in this direction. So we're not gonna really deal with the actual physics of what the electrons are doing. We're gonna be dealing with what we measure, which is current and current and what we have here and this is part of the lab uh, three which you'll be dealing with talk about uh, Ohm's law and that's given by I is uh, V over R And this current, because we have charge, so we define current as the change of charge over change of time. So this is in units of coulombs per second, which we call an amp or capital A amp, capital A for amps. So we'll be deal defining current as charge that passes by a point per second and the units are amps and from a circuit which has a resistor would be an actual resistor like we've done uh, we have in little demonstrations we'll be doing using lab four uh, a resistor or it could consist of a bulb a battery bulb and this will be connected to a battery of some sort, which we give that symbol. And the current I is defined as the voltage divided by the resistance. So as an example, if we have a 12 volt battery over a 100 ohm resistor, our current would be uh, 0.12 amps. So that would be the current in this case. Right. We define current as that in amps in Ohm's law for a simple circuit. We'll get into parallel and series circuits later on in chapter uh, 20, 19 in more detail. We'll talk about this uh, later on too when we get to power, right? So, so the way it works, then we have Ohm's law. Again, hook up a battery. You hook the positive to one end of the resistor, the other end back to So this forms a closed loop. And then we call this a series circuit. All right, as you'll see compared to uh, what we see in lab four, particularly with a parallel circuit, and how we measure voltage and current with that. That's part of lab four, so I won't go much into the details there. 
All right. So lab three deals with Ohm's law and comparing uh, voltage, well, comparing voltage and current for certain type of bulbs. So we'll go into here in more detail. All right. Uh, we're not going to get into the uh, science or the way resistors are labeled. All right, a resistor has three different lines to it, which we're not going to get. So this has red, brown, red, and that indicates the value of the resistor. So if you're trying to make actual circuits, that's what you use there, uh, but we're not going to get into that for this particular course. All right, so that's the first part. So a resistor, so this resistor has an ohm, may have a resistance of 100 ohms. So the resistance of this thing is 100 ohms. Um, this one may be a little bit different. Um, so an object has a resistor. Is a resistor. Now we're going to get into the concept now of comparing this to resistivity. So in this simple circuit, we have a battery, uh, a 12 volt battery, uh, an, a resistor, and it makes a current. So moving on to the next part here. Then, all right, we're going to go into 18.4, which is resistivity. All right, so as an example, all right, this resistor has a resistance of, so this has a resistance of 220 ohms. Right? This wire would have a certain amount of resistance. Looks like, can't tell, yeah, copper wire has a resistance to it. But it is made out of copper, right, Cu. And this has a, what we call resistivity. Copper, the material copper as a resistivity rho, the Greek letter rho, that depends only on the properties of the material. And for copper, uh, the resistivity is 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters, right? So that's what the resistivity of the copper is. And then based on that, say like this wire, if we make a wire, a copper a wire out of this uh, copper, say it's oh, approximately a length of 10 centimeters, which is 0.1 meters. And it has a diameter of, let's say, a radius of one millimeter, which is 10 to the minus 30 meters. All right, which is about right, it's about a millimeter in radius. Then the resistance of this thing is given by rho times L over A. All right? Where L is the length and A is given by pi r squared. Now this kind of might make sense as far as this because resistance is how much does it actually flow? How much, you know, what's the uh, impedance to the current flow? 
uh, the length of a wire. We do an analogy a lot of times with pipes is if I have a pipe of a certain length and area, the longer it is, the harder it is, you know, the more the electrons have to go through. And if we have a smaller area, there's less room for the electrons to pass through. So this makes sense as far as this is concerned. All right. Now, I'm not going to do it exactly. Uh, but let's see, this would be pi times point 10 to the minus third squared, which would be approximately three times 10 to the minus sixth would be the area. And then therefore, the resistance of this actual wire that I have here somewhere, Well, anyway, um, the resistance of that wire, which is about 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters in length, will be given by around 1.68 times 10 to the minus eighth times 0.1 or 10 to the minus first divided by three times 10 to the minus sixth. That would be, then let's see. Let's see here, 16. Let's see, that's about point, 0.68, that's about 0.5 times 10 to the minus or resistance would be 5 times 10 to the minus 4 ohms. A pretty small resistance. So as you might expect, as we actually know, copper, I mean, a wire should actually allow current to flow through it. You don't want a large resistance. So it has a small resistance to it. So that would be the approximate resistance of this wire. So it depends on the resistivity, which is only on the material, the length, and the area. So I have two other ones. So if I have a piece of copper like this rod, both of these have the same resistivity. They both have, they're both made out of copper, same resistivity. But obviously this one, will have a long, different resistance because it is longer and it has a much wider cross-sectional area. So its resistance, if I was to calculate it, would be different, All right? So that's the difference between resistivity and resistance. And we can get into the range of this. The book is very good at this, and I'll just show the table quick. This is table 18.1. And what we see here is that silver metals have very low resistivity, so they allow conduction. On the other hand, you have a glass insulators which have a resist resistivity of approaching 10 to the 10th. And then we have semiconductors which have resistivities on the order of one. So you have a ray, a huge range. Copper is 10 to minus eighth. Glass has a resistivity on the order of 10 to the 10. So this is a factor of 10 to the 20th difference as far as that is concerned. So glass is an extremely good insulator. Copper and other metals are extremely good um, conductors as far as that's concerned. All right, so that's one thing. All right, next thing we're going to get into, we talk about it here, is uh, temperature dependence. And this will be part of lab five because resistors have a, or metals, materials have a 
temperature dependence. And example, so we have a temperature dependence This is given by rho of t is rho naught times one plus alpha t minus t naught, which t naught is generally defined as room temperature on 20 degrees C, or it could be zero. So this shows the temperature dependence of that. And so what it means is as the temperature goes up, the resistivity is going to go up. So the temperature resistivity will go up in generally a linear fashion where alpha is the coefficient of temperature dependence. And rho naught is what it is at the standard temperature. So if temperature, so we compare it to 20 degrees, then that's what we have. So it's generally a linear dependence. And we'll see, this is actually how we can measure um, temperature, is by having a, a, resist, a temperature resistant thermo thermometer, or what we actually will call, we'll see this in chapter five, in lab five, is a thermistor. So this is actually how we measure temperature electronically is using a thermistor. And we'll see this in lab five, it's actually quite accurate as far as that's concerned. So that's resistivity, right? And we'll see, this is part of 18 for thermistor. So moving on to the next part here, I'll leave that up. And we'll talk about 18.5, which is electric power. Now remember Ohm's law, is I is V over R, or V is I times R, depending on what you're given, all right? So this is a relationship right now, electric power, and this will be measured in watts, right? So I have a 100 watt light bulb, watt bulb, right? And this is also related to lab three on electric power. And the way this works is most household circuits, right? The voltage is 120 volts. And it's what we call AC or alternating current. And I'll probably have an extra credit video, video related to this, um, um, comparing alternating current, DC current. So I'll, I'll look at that and see what I can come up with. So you'll see a link on, on the main content page, plus I'll send an email out but if I get that set up. So, uh, so electric power, so if you have a circuit with a bulb, Let's just do a bulb. And it's hooked up to a 120 volt circuit. It has a current based on the resistance, what kind of bulb you got. So if the current say is, um, and we'll, not, we'll just make up a bulb. Um, if the current, we're not, we'll just have some other source here. If the current is say one amp, then the power 
in watts is given by V times I. All right, again, this compares differently to Ohm's law. This is not Ohm's law. The power is V times a current. Uh, the relationship, this is different from Ohm's law. So we have power and the current. So in this case, the power would be 120 volts, because that's a household circuit, times one amp would be 120 watts, right? All right, now, if we have a, you know, we did a lab, I might as well talk about that. Say a lab with a 75 watt light bulb. All right, how much current is actually being drawn in that? If we have a 75 watt light bulb, the voltage is still 120 volts. The power would be 75 watts. The current using this relationship would be P over V, which would be 75 over 120 is approximately 0 0.6 amps. So that's approximately how much current that 100 watt light bulb would draw. Now, as you saw with the other thing, we compare this, so a standard 75 watt light bulb produces that much. It produces light, but it consumes that much power. Now, if we have, look at, on the other hand, comparing this, so this is an incandescent bulb, I see, incandescent bulb, IB we'll use. An LED bulb uh, only consumes about 15 watts. So running at 120 volt, the current it actually takes is P over V, which is 15 over 120, or roughly 0.09 amps. So it runs at about one fifth the power but produces the same amount of light. Because in an incandescent bulb, almost all the energy is wasted as heat. So that's part of lab three, if you haven't done that already. It's now available as far as that's concerned. All right, so we're gonna be dealing with, uh, is power, we'll be using household circuits for this. The power is 100, you know, usually 120 volts. Uh, 120 volts household and depending on the current you get the power with that right. and we're using alternating cur current as compared to direct current which is like a, a standard battery so moving on here Moving on, we now have, oh, oh yeah, actually the last part of this section, it's actually a fairly simple chapter. Uh, we're not going to get into details of alternating current, we'll talk about that a little bit right now, but alternating current is if we measure voltage versus time, same for a, a battery. So if I have a simple battery, which I don't have here, but let's see a simple battery, right? This is a nine volt battery, it has a plus and minus to it. If I measure the voltage across this thing over time with the voltmeter, the voltage time will be constant at nine volts. It'll just stay constant. This is what we call direct current. Alternating current, on the other hand, oscillates, is alt oscillating with a frequency of 60 hertz for household. And basically it goes from roughly plus 120 volts to minus 120 volts, 60 times a second. So this is what we have for household circuit. The voltage 
is 120 volts, but oscillates between plus and minus 60 times a second. Now I say, why do we do that? Well, it turns out, as we'll see, uh, that this is the easiest type of power to um, generate using a generator, like a power plant. It's far easier to produce AC current as compared to DC current. And we'll get into a little bit of history later on, but this will actually compare AC current, which was developed by George Westinghouse as compared to Thomas Edison, who developed AC current. So again, if I find this link for a video, which is really good, it's called Power Plants, compares these two, and the story between those, that's what we're, I'll talk about more of that later. So we're dealing with AC current for all of our plants here. This is only if you have a battery for simple circuits. All right. So that's 18.7, so I'm gonna go back to 18.6 and finish up on there. All right. And that'll be the end of this uh, lecture, chapter 18. And what we have here is power 18.6, power in household circuits. And for here, again, we're using the voltage is 120 volts. Uh, the power is V times I, right? And this will be in watts. And this is volts and this is amps, all right? So what does this mean? Um, an example here, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll show this picture here of different appliances that we hook up to one what we call circuit breaker. All right, we have a light bulb, electric heater, power amplifier, and a hair dryer. All right, so what we have here is the fact if we apply, these are all um, hooked, attached, in parallel, All right? Meaning they're all hooked up in parallel to the circuit. Now, if you have, if you look at uh, your circuit breaker, your circuit breaker downstairs, you have a switch and they're all based on say, some kind of current, say 20 amps. Right, they're all running at 120 volts, 20 amp circuit breaker. What does that mean? All right, you have each circuit breaker as a certain is maybe hooked up to one part of the house that has a couple outlets, a light, a light switch, and so on. So if I have light bulb, bulb. A hundred, let's make it kind of easy, 120 volts, 120 watts, right? Uh, heater, which runs at say 1800 watts. And then um, Then let's have just a hair dryer. So you're in your bathroom, turn the heater on, hair dryer of 1500 watts. All right, then we all hooked up in parallel. And they're all plugged into the same outlet. And the question is then how much will this break the circuit breaker? All right, now for 120, that's going to be V times I, V 
times I, V times I. So for each one, we can figure out the current it draws. So for the bulb, so one, two, three, for one, that'll be 120 divided by 120 watts would be one amp. For number two, that would be, oh, 120 volt watts over 120 volts. Got it backwards. So it's given by P over V. Second one is 1800 over 120, which would be uh, 15 amps. And for the third one, it's going to be 1500 over 120, which is 12.5 amps. So all of these together, you add this up together, and this is 27 and a half amps, all right? The circuit breaker can only take 20 amps. Otherwise, it starts creating too much heat in the wire and the wires can overheat and cause a fire. Uh, so what would happen is you try to do all three of these at once and it will draw too much current and break the circuit breaker. So the only way this would work is if I do the um, the light bulb and then one of the other two. So this plus this would give me 16 amps, that would be fine. This plus that would give me 13 and a half amps would be fine. But these two together, it's 28 amps actually. These two together give me 27 and a half and that's not gonna work. So a circuit breaker allows, so you don't draw too much current because we'll see uh, later on is that any real circuit current, any real circuit uh, generates heat. And we'll see that later on uh, when we talk about transformers and stuff. So that is chapter 18. And that'll be the biggest thing as far as that's concerned. So chapter 18.